Hello everyone, welcome back to Design Huddle, uh, the podcast where two internet friends talk tech and design and everything in between. This week, again, Ryan is out because of time zones, um, but we have an amazing guest whose work I've been watching for quite a number of years and also cited in my own articles. Um, she's a front-end developer, previously a front-end developer manager at a news organisation in Seth. Seven West Media, that seems like in Western Australia, that seems like a, uh, <laughs> a, a tongue-tied tongue twister, and now currently works as a senior software engineer at Higher Up. Uh, she speaks at events both internationally and locally, obviously now everyone's at home, uh, so not so much of that. I'm working on um, experiment with new and old technology, so welcome, Mandy, M- Mandy Michael. I've, be, I've been calling you Mandy Michaels, I don't know why I've been adding an S to your name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, uh, thank you for having me. Yes, everybody calls me Mandy Michaels, and I like to tell people that there's only one of me, so we don't need the S on the end. Um, but you're not the first; it's totally fine. <laughs> where is that? Where is that coming from? I don't know. It's like Michael. I don't know. Is I there think, like a famous person? No, I think it's because Michael is a first name, and so people automatically try and make it into a last name by putting the S on the end because it confuses uh, them. I think all, that's all da- where it comes from. Ordaining, ordaining the surname. Um, so yeah. you're based in Australia, obviously, by the sound of your accent. Uh-huh, yeah, I am. I'm in Western Australia though. So like when people think of Australia, they think of Sydney. I am on the opposite, like directly opposite it on the West Coast, which is like a five hour plane ride. So it's, yeah, the f- it's like isolation and everything. Okay. But your your time zone is much closer to say Europe and America, though, right? Or is it yeah, yeah. So uh, we are this. Yes, Europe, um, Britain. We're all in the same ish zone um, to to the east coast. East coast is like two hours ahead of us right now. So um, the the one thing which I remember that. when visiting Australia went to Sydney is um, people telling me to be careful because everything's trying to kill you. Number one like animals wise. Number two, yeah. Australians are really sarcastic and encouraging that everything's trying to kill you as well. Like I've seen where you say, oh, apparently there's this mythical beast that is, exists that's in trees and it will jump down and attack you. And all Australians will go into like, yeah, 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 that, that, that thing does exist without yeah, like- Yeah, the drop bear. Yeah, yeah the drop bear. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful. They're, they're pretty dangerous. <laughs> so just to get into it, um, how, how have you, what you, what have you been working on these days? I mean, how, how you, have you been, how, how have you been dealing with creating stuff during lockdown? Uh, look, I'm going to be totally honest and just share firstly that because I live in Perth, we haven't really had a, a proper lockdown. Um, oh, congratulations. Yeah. 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 We're pre- we've been super lucky. So at the beginning of COVID, we were locked down for like maybe a few months. Um, so, but by like June last year, we were pretty much back to normal in, in the West coast of Australia. Um, we don't really even have to wear masks or anything when we go out. Um, just occasionally, like we'll have one case of community transmission and then we get locked down for five days and you have to wear masks out, but you can still go to the shop and stuff. So in terms of work impact hasn't been as severe other parts of the world? Yeah, not really. Um, We haven't really been impacted that badly in that regard. Um, At the beginning, sure, it was kind of the same as as everywhere else. And, you know, some people lost jobs and stuff, but um, we've been pretty okay since about June last year. Um, This year we've had a couple of um, little short lockdowns, but like it's nothing in compared to what everyone else suffered. So it's not like, it's not really impacted me a whole great deal, if I'm being totally honest. Um, well, but, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you can't help but uh, obviously be aware of how it is for everyone else and worried about how your friends and your family elsewhere are going. So you still get affected, I guess, in that way. Um, but uh, I I sort of taken a tiny bit of a break from, from doing stuff um, since... COVID started last year, I sort of, uh, I, I was doing like a whole bunch of stuff with variable fonts and, um, you know, my text effects, which is my, my side hobby. Um, I've done a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I've done a little bit of that here and there. I am actually working on a project at the moment. Um, but I'm nowhere near finished yet. Um, I guess I can tell you about it. Do you want to know about it? Yeah, I think we'll go into some of that. I just wanted to, um, uh, give more of an introduction because most of our audience is going graphic design background and and so one of the reasons why i really want to be on the show is you're one of those 
really unique um, individuals who's a create what I would describe as a creative coder. I know that sounds yeah. very. <laughs> it sounds very. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what the correct term is, but uh, yeah, it, it, like it's, my brain's completely fried because I gave a talk last night. Um, <laughs> but it sounds very silly, but and actually, it, it is a genuine thing that you're a creative coder. Um, and we'll go into some of the typography experiments, and also if you can help us explain what variable typography in a sec. But I want. I was curious: is is your background purely engineering, or do you have like? Because from the work that I've seen of yours, it, it's very artistic. So, do you have an artistic like? Not an artistic background, but an artsy background in terms of university. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, I do have an artsy background. Not like professionally or anything, but like I always loved art. I like making physical things. So like I always liked sculpture and textiles and, okay. and that kind of stuff. So like I make costume props. I have this great, um, you know, Ma the Maleficent movie with Angelina Jolie. Yeah. how she played Maleficent. I made her staff. Oh, so wow. it, cause I, I do a bit of cosplay on occasion. Um, and <laughs> it, you can control it with a phone to change the colors and stuff is like blue. Okay, that's LEDs next level. And stuff. Yeah. Like, so I like, I like physically making stuff. So I always did a lot of that. Um, like, you know, in high school and, and stuff, but, um, I actually studied multimedia, which was like, um, back in the day before like, it's is whatever it's called now. It was like yeah. CD ROM design and yeah. <laughs> um, you know, graphic design and photography, like digital photography and, and did you did you learn how to use director by any chance? Yes, Flash. I yeah, did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they actually um I I was the last class to learn director before it got replaced with Flash. Okay, which... yeah, same here pretty much. Which also is now not a thing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I I I did um I did a lot of uh because I like I was obsessive Backstreet Boy fan. I used to make Backstreet Boy fan sites. So then I learned how to use Photoshop and stuff, so I could make you know pictures for my Backstreet Boy fan site. Um, so I did a lot of uh, digital digital photography and photoshopping and graphics and stuff. Um, so I guess in a way I would say that I'm artsy. Um, but I don't really do much outside. Most of the stuff I do is always like got a little bit of a digital aspect, you know? Um, yeah. So w w were you in the era of like, um, hacking MySpace pages as well then? Um, I never had a MySpace page. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> so I, because I was, I was too busy on my Backstreet Boy fan sites to have a MySpace page. Um, but I did hack my sister's MySpace page for her because she <laughs> wanted things. She wanted Care Bear GIF. Um, I don't know why I remember this, but she was like, can you make it so there is this Care Bear GIF on my MySpace page? And I went, yeah, sure, I can totally do that. Um, but yeah. Do you no, still I use those have... techniques today then? Uh, <laughs> I have actually used the GIF as a background <laughs> image for a thing I'm working on at the moment. I was going to say no, but uh, that would be a lie. Um, not frequently, though. <laughs> the code's changed a little bit since then. Yeah, but isn't that, I mean, I've always found that amazing because I, very similar background, study graphic design, multimedia, saw blink mm -hmm. tag, you know, this is uh, the, the cliche. Um, but it's still funny how some of those things, those experimental moments you still use, even if it's just the logical figuring something out, which I always find. So um, have you considered putting Care Bear animated GIFs on your portfolio site? Just as a uh, <laughs> oh, I, mm, I, 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 No I explanation, you... just like... <laughs> would be my answer to that then. No explanation, no context. I have considered it. Um, but I'm, I was always more into a starry background, you know, the classic 90s animated GIF background, the stars. Like G Geo Cities with the sort. Yeah. I mean, Geo Cities where I hosted my Backstreet Boy fan site. So yeah, I was always a bit of a Geo Cities girl myself. So how did you get into the actual coding side? I mean, was that, did you do like university um, or was it just pure from multimedia into the um, industry? Well, no, it was, yeah. So when I went to uni, I did multimedia and there was like coding aspects in it. Actually, funnily enough, I distinctly remember doing a web course and saying, I will never be a web developer. <laughs> <laughs> that did not end the way I expected. Um, but while I was doing multimedia, I also did a bachelor of science in information systems, <laughs> which was kind of like databases and a bit of computer science and stuff. 
Um, so that's how I kind of learned other coding, I guess, aside from web stuff. Um, but I actually didn't get into development right after uni. I, um, I became a online comms manager for a PR agency. So for public relations. So I did a lot of like online communications. So it was like really early social media, but mm. like I managed a lot of digital projects for them. And then I became a digital project manager for an advertising agency. Um, and it was about, so I, I kind of managed digital stuff online for about seven years before I became a front end developer full time. Um, because I hated being a project manager. It's like the hardest job in the world from my perspective. Um, and I preferred building websites. So then yeah. I switched over. So it, it took me a little while after, um, you need to actually become, I guess, a developer. Um, yeah. How did but you yeah, find most... the transition? Uh, oh, so easy. Um, I like really? people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was already doing a lot of front end work because, uh, the team I was in at the time was quite small. There was me, um, a designer, a back end developer and a front end developer. And there wasn't an, um, there was so much work that, uh, I would help out the front end developer to get all the code done because, you know, I knew how to build websites um already so i would help out so i did a lot of work and i found that the only time i was happy at work was when i was doing that which wasn't yeah. actually my job so i asked to when our front-end developer was leaving i asked if i could have his job um and it was super easy i had like a six month transition period where i still had to do some project management but mm. um then i was full-time front-end <laughs> and it was like it was so easy for me to switch into that and because I was, you know, much happier and I was having a good time. So I actually didn't find it difficult at all. Well, can I ask, what year roughly was the tra was that transition? Oh, gosh. Uh... The reason why I asked the year is because that gives me an idea because I studied graphic design and tried to basically rip my hair out for about 10 years trying to figure out how to align stuff with CSS or even just like table layouts. So I'm trying to think, okay, when was that? Because... It couldn't have been 2004 because that's when I hated myself because I was just no, banging my head against my <laughs> it, it wasn't 2004. Um, it, it was, I was still supporting IE6 on some projects. Oh, okay. um, 2010 then? Yeah, it was around 2010, 2011 maybe. <clears throat> we were okay, like yeah. just phasing it out. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it was, um, I'd only done, I'd been doing table layouts in like, side projects yeah but i think uh from a work perspective we started to move away from them so like you still didn't have custom fonts unless you use something like sipper or coupon um yeah the, the but, embedding technique yeah, yeah yeah the embedding <laughs> techniques um there was you couldn't use pngs in some things because there was still older browser support but it's it quickly like i don't know how many people realize how quickly it shifted from all of yeah. that stuff and how fast the web in that respect has developed. Like it's, well, it must be what, five, maybe like eight or 10 years or something. Like that's, yeah. that's pretty quick. I, I think, um, yeah. for that, that stuff to, to, I guess, come into existence and disappear. Yeah. Um, just for those who are actually on the YouTube channel, you've got a dog on your head. Oh, so, yes. so, so could, could you explain the dog on your head? I just um, wanted a, a weird transition. <laughs> it's a um, it's a Snapchat filter, which I just think is cute because I like dogs. Um, and I came across this one the other day, and it's currently my favourite. Uh, that's there's no like great um explanation other than I think it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying out the Snapchat because basically the Snapchat filter, which you uh, in the in whatever software you're using, that becomes the camera that you choose, right? That's right. Yeah. I, I tried I tried using I end up always picking like Mortal Kombat character type things of my oh, eyes yeah, yeah. on fire. But then you're having a try and have a serious meeting with a manager and it's like, yeah, I'm not really happy with that and you got fire coming out of your eyes. Um so moving okay, so that was a, a segue, an an ad segue. Um, it's great. <laughs> moving back, um so where I first discovered your work was some of the typography things that you're doing and variable type, uh, variable typography. Mm -hmm. Um, could you explain what variable fonts are or variable typography in a, yes. if it's even possible to explain? Yeah, no, it is. Um, so variable, variable fonts are like, you know how you have fonts at the moment and you have like a bold font and a regular 
and maybe um, a semi bold or a black or something like that. And they're all like individual files. Um, a variable font basically combines all of those into one file. Um, but what it does in addition, which is what I love about them, is that it interpolates between the values. So like when, when you would represent a font weight in, in code, you'd go 400 for regular, um, 700 for bold, 900 for black. Um, you can, with a variable font, have 400, 700, and 900 all in the same file, but you because it interpolates between the values, you also get like 401, 402, all the way up to 900. So you can get like that perfect weight for whatever you're designing, or you can have a few extra ones in between. Um, so I think the way it's being described best to me is that it's one font file that acts like many font files. Yeah. Um, and so as a result of that, uh, people who are good at making fonts, um, so font foundries and stuff have started making a whole bunch of really cool stuff. So you can get a font that has, um, all different weights in it. It can also have, um, like width. So, uh, you know, a, a narrow version, uh, like condensed font or really wide. And you can have that, um, you can animate those or, or transition between the weight, the width as well, or you can go from, uh, italic to not italic. Yeah. Um, there's also, uh, uh, you know, optical sizing if you're, a, if you're a font, um, nerd and like that stuff, um, or my favorite part of it, cause I like to make the text effects and stuff is people make like effects in the fonts. So like there's one that kind of looks like a slinky, you know, the, the toy, yeah. the slinky. Um, where it's like, looks like normal letters, but then what the axis allows it to sort of stretch out and it, it creates that like repetitive effect of the, the letters, um, leaving, I guess, kind of like an after image behind, yeah. or there's one that drips, um, which I think is really cool. Um, so I, I feel like variable fonts have allowed people to make some really, um, cool creative things that can also be animated. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. That's like a really short, not detailed explanation of variable fonts. Obviously no, no, that's great. a lot more to it, but, um, they're super cool. I really like them. Lots of so, benefits to them. So from a sort of designer's perspective, ugh, I'm trying to learn how to speak again from a designer's perspective, uh, you've got like, say you open up illustrator or Photoshop, um, you've got your bold, your italic and your placement alignment. And maybe there's like some things which Adobe will allow you to make a typeface, which isn't a true italic, slightly italic. Variable yeah. fonts is almost like an extra layer of granularity of being able to edit the the feeling of the font from the thinness yeah. of the strokes, depending on what the typographer has done. Yeah, totally. Um, that's exactly what it is. And what I think is really nice about that is because the typographer has um, like made the font to account for that so they can see the interpolation. So sometimes they'll like create a new um, instance in it to tweak the how it looks at each point um so i guess there's like a lot more care given at those interim states than maybe there, there previously would have been um yeah. but but yeah you you do get that granularity um which you kind of would see a lot more in print design um because yeah. you know like you would have lots of different font weights in print design but on the web there's always been this thing that like you've got to limit it because of performance um variable fonts typically in my experience um are equivalent to having like a bold and a regular on your site but <clears throat> you have way more than just a bold and a regular right you've got all of that in between so yes. i think it allows you to be um more uh considered in how you apply your typography than you were able to before because of restrictions like by performance and file size uh, which i like because I think it's important to convey tone and stuff in that way. So, I mean, it's <clears throat> a lot of times on the web, the reasons for us changing the way that we design and do things have always been quite technical. So it's like mm -hmm. losing flash was because it was inaccessible and proprietary and all that. Well, this feels like this is the first time tech has evolved where the advantages are not just for technical performance, but an actual creative thing, which you've actually explored yourself in, in yes. some of your creative typography projects. Yes, I absolutely agree. I think um, 
when I talk about variable fonts, one of the things I talk about is how we uh, typically, like you say, with technology, we're always making trade-offs. It's like, you can do this cool thing, but you'll lose this thing over here. Um, whereas I feel like with variable fonts, um, there aren't that many negative trade-offs. Um, sometimes, depending on the, like, you know, every font file varies. Sometimes it might be a little bit um, bigger file size, but usually if you add up all of the fonts, weights that you would use, it's still better off. Um, but yeah, you get you get a lot more variation and a lot more opportunity with a variable font typically than you would with a standard font. But you also gain performance benefits because you, know, you can um, have one font that encompasses everything rather than, you know, five different fonts uh, with all the weights that you would want to use that are like five times the size. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously it, you have to check because it's not always the case, but um, there are a lot of technical upsides and there are a lot of creative upsides to variable fonts, um, at least in my experience. I'm actually just doing an experiment with font at work today um, and, the variable font is 68 kilobytes um, compressed and subset um, to Latin characters only. It has like so much stuff in it. So we had to cut some out. Um, yeah. But the single weight, so like bold was, uh, how much did I say it was 68? It's like yeah. 58 for the single weight. So oh, for wow. one weight, you get it's 58 kilobytes. For the variable font with all of them, it's 68. So for the extra 10 kilobytes, you get all these options. Um, and if you were to have bold and regular, that's like double the size almost. So <clears throat> the technical benefits are use the variable font. Yeah, of course. Um, so yes, it is one, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons that I like it. It's one of the few new tech um, creations, I guess. I don't know how to describe it, that lets you have benefits in both directions, uh, so, which is cool. Yeah, so uh, moving from that is your typography experiments, which I suppose for so folks who, um, as a point of reference, and we will link to it in, in the show notes and whatnot, um, it's kind oh. of like Photoshop filters. Oh, I just heard dog barking. <laughs> no, that's Jello, my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jello. Um, so uh, it's almost like Photoshop filters, which I think for like designers, you might not realize that, okay, that's really cool. But the, the interesting thing is this is like Photoshop filters on typefaces that can be edited on the fly. And so you only design yeah. the, the, the effect and then anybody can actually use it thereafter. So how did you get into creating those things? Oh, that's a bit of a sad story. Um, okay. <laughs> so I was really burnt out um, a few years ago. I can't remember when I started making text effects. I was really burnt out and I was going to quit web development because um, oh. I'd, I'd had enough. I was tired and I didn't want to do it anymore. And my partner said to me that, oh, you know, why don't you just try doing something fun and, you know, trying to remember what it is that you liked about web development. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. Um, so I started looking for Photoshop text effects and then I would find them and then I would remake them in CSS. That was my, my little side project hobby, like trying to make um, effects in uh, Photoshop text effects in CSS without, you know, imagery or canvas or JavaScript. Um, so that's kind of how I started making them. It was actually looking for Photoshop things and trying to redo it. Um, and then that kind of just extended out into variable fonts as well. Cause I was like, oh, I could make some really cool stuff with variable fonts. Um, but what I wanted to do was show people that uh, you didn't need JavaScript, you didn't need Canvas or SVG to do some of this stuff. We, you could make really cool text like you would see in print um, in CSS with real text that's accessible um, for, you know, assistive technology and that could be edited easily. So, you know, if you were putting content in a, a content management system, it would still work if that text changed. So that was kind of what I was trying to do with it. Um, and then it just kind of became a fun little side hobby that I would do from time to time. And I made a whole collection of them on code pen and stuff. Um, could, you describe, how I started. could you describe the first one and then the feeling you had after, uh, cause I'm interested in them cause we've, we've spoken to people about mental health in particular, like in, on, um, design hurdles. So I'm just interested that kind of 
like how did you what did you create and then how did you feel at the end of it <laughs> so i don't remember what the first one i made was um there seems like a grass, there's one that's green the green grass one I, 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 that was the first that was the second variable font one that I made, um, the grass one. So I'll, I'll explain that one in a minute. The first text effect that I made that I remember being like, wow, how did I make this? There was a Photoshop text effect where the text looked like it was folded off the page. Oh, okay. And I was like, I'm going to see if I can make that in CSS. And I made it in CSS and I was like, this is so cool. I can't believe I made this. <clears throat> and later I went back and looked at it and went, how did I do that? <laughs> um, so that one I'm quite fond of because, uh, I later figured out four different ways to make it, which I thought was cool because it was the kind of thing that you would think you'd need a picture for like an image, yeah. but it was editable text. When you hovered it, it would animate. Um, and so that one, I was like, wow, this is cool. And that was the one that got me excited to make more. Um, the grass one with the variable font. I, that was the second variable font one I made because I was doing a talk and I wanted to show people how cool variable fonts were because I felt like people didn't really appreciate how cool the technology was because yeah. all the demos at the time were like, oh, if you hover over this, it can increase the weight. Like that was pretty much what you could find. There was no like really cool demos. So I thought I found this font called Decova, which was an experimental variable font at the time. And I was like playing around with it. And then one of them looked kind of like leaves. And I was like, cool, uh, I know what I'm going to make. So I whipped out my <laughs> catalog of Photoshop text effects. Um, and I picked the grass one, which I'd been trying to make for ages, but could never get right. Um, so it was a variable font that enabled that. And I remember when I made it, I... I finished it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And I turned my laptop to my, my partner. And I was like, hey, check this out. And he's like, that's really great. And I was like, <laughs> you have no idea. This is so cool. <laughs> um, and like, I thought it was cool. And I was like, I'm happy with this. And then I tweeted it. And then and lots of people thought it was really cool. And I was like, I was right. This is cool. I'm not the only one that thinks this is cool. So um, I was pretty happy with that because after that, a lot more people started like doing really cool and um, interesting things with variable fonts. And I think people became more interested in it. And I think also uh, that sort of rolled on to more um, typographers yeah. making more interesting things with variable fonts as well. Like they branched out from just weight and width, which I thought yeah. was, was nice. So in terms of like how you like... Is it was in that a moment that you actually thought actually I, want, I, I rekindled your your love for front end development? I mean, how how was that? Because I'm interested in sort of like um, using art for. I maybe I might be uh, dramatizing this a bit much just for, but using um, art to help heal like mental health, like an app, app, that creative thing. Because often you're stuck in a workplace, um, and it just feels like you're just churning stuff in a factory. Where it's like, but then there's that moment where you rekindle mm. your passion for why you actually decided to do this in the first place. Yeah, I think um, like when I was making the text effects, because I I'd kind of rekindled my passion before I'd gotten to the variable font stage, that just kept it going. Um, I think what felt nice was that I got to create something that I had made and that I was doing for me um, that I was proud of. And uh, I think uh, the way I, I was described to me, which really resonated was that I'd made a body of work of text effects. Like I hadn't yeah. just made one thing. I'd made a body of work that was examples of things that you could do. And as a result of that, I also learned a lot more in depth stuff about how CSS worked, um, yeah. which I then could use to make things easier in my day to day job. Like I understood better how gradients work and how text shadow works and you know how I could layer things and like all these kind of little things that I understood but not at a deep level I now understood much more deeply because I was trying to be creative with it um so yeah it I think it definitely healed me making something I didn't have deadlines on it was just fun it didn't matter if they failed I have like hundreds of ones that didn't work out that are like private on my code pen that sometimes I go back to and finish later when I get a good idea. Yeah. Um, but it, it was nice because it was not like, 
I wasn't required to do anything. I just did it because it was fun. Creativity for creativity's sake. Exactly. That's exactly it. And I think um, as, you know, a lot of developers and uh, our creative people as well, and, you know, same for designers, sometimes I think we have to remember that we, you know, it's great to do something that you love, but if you don't allow yourself to have a play sometimes, that yeah. you're going to lose that love. So make time to, as you say, be creative for creative sake and just have fun with it from time to time. Yeah. Do, do you yeah. find that? Yeah, no, I mean, there's there's been, uh, my mind's come, gone completely blank, but there was a <laughs> <Sorry>. talk. With, <laughs> no, no, there was a talk that I saw recently, which was from 10 years ago, I believe. It was a study that was done that was exploring the idea of innovation and how the argument that the, the scientist was giving that innovation and creativity cannot be planned. And mm -hmm. there, was, there was this visual experiment where uh, it's like a really archaic tool where it will have like four blobs and then you pick a blob and then you press randomize and then it'll create four children based on that blob. And then you th it sounds really um, weird, but when they put it out to the world, what they found is people were generating these like bits of art just by saying, okay, that one kind of looks like a flower. Let me um, mutate that one. And then you see all the, like, these amazing things like Spider-Man's face that people have gradually mutated. And what, he, what they were trying to demonstrate is that... Um, if you just try to randomly do that, you would never, or use machine learning, to, you would never get to this kind of level of finding something and exploring. And it's, do some, is there a case of the innovation happens in that moment of, I don't know what I'm really looking for, I'm just exploring. And so challenging the, the notion of open planned offices, the way we develop software or whatever way we have mm. got strategy, does that actually impede finding something that could be much more beneficial? That's why I find this... Um, so yes, <laughs> to yeah, your question. I, I totally agree. I think the things that I'm most well known for and the things that people have always found really interesting of my work and the things that I've always, I guess, grown as a developer and, and you know, I, I don't consider myself a designer, but, um, you know, the no, you definitely stuff, are. Well, I would, I would not identify as a designer, but I, I, I do enough where I think I dabble in design. Um, I'm a coder who loves design is how I'd put it. Uh, I think the things that I've done best are the ones where I haven't been trying to make something, if that makes sense. I've been yeah, of course. experimenting and exploring and then something amazing has come out of that. Like I was never trying to do something to share with people, um, or, you know, to show people cool stuff. I was just trying to find out what was cool about that particular thing. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up with something which was, which was nice. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you. Like, have you ever considered <laughs> collating all this into a book, like almost like a self-help book for people who are stuck, but then you actually teach them to create ver variable typefaces. I'm giving you business oh, ideas. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool idea. Um, I have not, uh, but, um, I think like anyone, I was like, oh, people don't need to know that. Like they, they, they know it already. I don't need to share mm. that with people. Now, you'd be surprised. I mean, I think because, again, it's like we all think that. But no, you, you, you realize what I found when I started giving talks in the community and, and uh, mentoring folks is you realize how much you actually know. And then mm. it's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Like people actually. Oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> moving on to that. I mean, how has the reaction from the community been, especially like the front end development community and design community with variable fonts, with the your experiment stuff, the variable uh. font stuff that you've been doing? Yeah, it's funny, right? Because um, I, for a really long time, just thought what I was doing was not that great. Um, like that it was just a thing that I did because at my local community, like, you know, I I'm sure it's like this for a lot of people, but in your local community where it's like people that you work with for a long time, like nobody thinks what you do is special, you know, <laughs> or that it's really good. You're just like, oh, that's just Mandy. She works at that place over there. Um, but then I went and did a talk uh, at Singapore CSS because um, oh, wow. I was over there for JSConf just to attend. And um, I got asked to speak at Singapore CSS and I, I did a talk on my text effects. And I'll never forget this. This girl comes up to me afterwards. She goes, oh, my God, I'm such a big fan. And I was like, <laughs> of me? <laughs> and she goes, yeah, I'm such a big fan. It's so great to meet you. I like love all your co-fans. I always check them out. And I was like, I have a fan. <laughs> and 
it yeah. like really it really took me by surprise because um you know all of a sudden all these other people were like yeah i'm such a big fan i love your work and i just all of a sudden felt um i I immediately felt self-conscious, but also like really happy that some people had found my work on Copen and like really liked it. Um, Did you I have the sensation to phone up your family and just scream vindication? <laughs> <laughs> no, my um, my partner was with me, and I I said to him afterwards, I was like, Dad, thanks. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, I oh, I know your work is really good. You, I'm so proud of you. Like he was really supportive and stuff. But I was like a little bit giddy for a while afterwards. Yeah, that some uh, some people had told me that they liked what I was doing. Like there's always a really nice feeling to have someone tell you that they like the stuff that you do. But it wasn't until I left Perth that I realized that people liked the stuff that I did. <laughs> um, yes, I guess so it's not the same at home. So when, uh, so I mean, it might be a few years ago. So when I was like looking into variable typography and I was going to write an article, the first thing I went to is interview some of the typographers. So David Burko, I believe his name is, who actually designed um, Decova or Decova. I can't pronounce that word. The Dec typeface well, that... I call it Decova. I don't know if that's correct. Um, he's would, never we'll corrected me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll go there. And so when I was, because I was just trying to, because at that point I was exploring um, typography and in the world of typography, there seem to be these two camps where you had people who are very traditionalist typists to be read. Um, and then you had the very um, type could be like a form that you look at. And so when I was talking about interviewing, he goes, uh, you know, you should speak to Mandy Michael. And I was like, OK, who's that? And, and he goes, oh, let me show you. And that's when I saw your grass technique. And then he said, like, I was like, OK, right now we're going to go. And then going down that path. And then once I started exploring it and because variable typography and these experiments are hard to explain, but when you show someone, they get it immediately. So then in yeah. the article that I wrote for, um, for Google, that's when I actually cited your work. And that's how I, I remember. I was very <laughs> excited. <laughs> um, it was very good. That, that, um, that particular variable font, uh, I think is probably one of the, um, things I'm most proud of because it was such a small thing to make, but it, I feel like, um, on reflection now, it's made such an impact because lots of people have said to me um, that it was the first uh, variable font, I guess, experiment they'd seen that made them realize they could do more than just, you know, um, type is to be read, uh, as you put it. Um, yeah. So I, I do feel like I can quit web now uh, having made a contribution to uh, the web platform in the form of inspiring people to make cool stuff with variable fonts. <laughs> Absolutely. Your, your name's added to the history, the annuals. Of, yeah, of the I, I feel like that's enough of an accomplishment for me that some people felt like now they can do more. That that feels that feels good. I think what well, I don't know that maybe I, so for me it's either having a large follower account or a Wikipedia page is like that's when I know I've made it and oh, I, I have made you... it. <laughs> what's what's I... a lot? What's a large follower account though? Because I feel like I've I know it's not that many um, in some people in comparison to some people in web, but I feel like my follower account is large enough um, that yeah, I can happily quit and feel like I've contributed to improving some people's web lives. It's definitely larger than mine. Um, but I mean, again, these things are all relative, right? You yeah. Know, and, I mean, and I think that although I admit that I, I, be, I at one point was very obsessive of these things, I think sometimes there's a degree of if too much might be unhealthy. <laughs> um, I, I feel like if you have one person um, come up to you and say, hey, that thing that you did really helped me, that's enough for me. Um, that one girl that came up and said she was my fan because she loved looking at my work. Um, I wish I remember her name. I remember her face perfectly. I'll never forget. Um, but I, for, I, I can't for the life of me remember her name. But but her, she she changed. She she was enough. Once she came up to me and said that 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 was enough for me. Um, That's excellent. Okay. Um, so I mean, just wrapping up. Uh, what are you? What what are the plans now? Are you working on anything new? I am working on something at the moment. Um, I I haven't really talked about it because I didn't want to have like pressure to finish it but I I've been meaning to remake my website because I don't currently have a website as like many web developers um, <laughs> I don't have time to make my own uh, but while I was coming up with what I wanted to do for it I was like oh maybe I should just make a generator so that I can make what I want so I'm, I'm presently working on a fan site generator oh nice so that my website can be a collection of fan sites of things that I love. Um, and it is, 
GeoCities inspired. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'll have some non 90s themes, I think, but I want it to be like the true fan site experience. Um, but it's proven, there's some things that I wanted to do that have proven a little bit difficult. Um, because like, I want to, uh, include my text effects and those kinds of things. So figuring out how to make that in a generated way, um, has been, uh, super fun. Like I want, I want someone to be able to like use my fan site generator and have this really cool variable font effect, um, and it worked for them in a number of scenarios. So I kind of feel like. It's how we can create little individual pages of art for things that we love. Um, the web is so full of things that we hate. I want things that we love. <laughs> Just a little little page, a little way to like share the, you know, like you love peanut butter sandwiches. Make a fan page <laughs> for peanut butter sandwiches. You know, like that's what I, I want to do. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, so I'm excited I, already. I can't wait to see. Yeah, I think it'll be, I think it'll be super fun when, when I've got it all finished. Um, even if it's just for my fun, like I feel like that would be enough. But if one person uses it to make a fan site for peanut butter sandwiches, I'll be like super happy. Then that would be your equivalent of a Wikipedia page. <laughs> yeah, that exactly. That would be my equivalent of a Wikipedia page. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much for spending your time with us. We really appreciate it, especially um, time zone. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you to our listeners for checking this out. Uh, We'll add all of the links of Amandi's amazing work to the show notes. And yeah, thank you very much, Mandy. Thank you so much. It was fun chatting.